Lemon Amiga present. A play giant video review. Sit back and enjoy the show. Hi there, welcome to another Lemon Amiga Play Guide and Review. This time we'll be checking out Wheels on Fire, developed by Prolixity and released by Epic Marketing in 1997. Checking out all those options, I'll mistakenly put that on easy mode and we'll stick to the main tracks for this, the ones that came with the CD and this came on a CD, but you have to install that on a hard drive before you can play it. And so let's change our name from one and user ID one and wrong user ID, that's fine. So you can change a limited number of options and you can see some rendered screens and you can see a map with some colors on there and they didn't really call much on the Amiga so I can't really talk much about them and so this was released in Poland, in Polish and things like that but this is a voxel racer and so this was released very late in the Amiga's development 1997 and let's face it by 97 Poland was the last place that the Amiga was popular before the doors closed so let's check out the first race here we go, this is a voxel racer If you haven't seen a voxel racer before, it's a very special type of racer where instead of using pixels, they use halfway between a pixel and a polygon, like you might see on other games, and polygons of course you can't move for polygons these days, so the voxel racer was a lost category that nobody asked for, and nobody wanted, and there are only a few examples of that on the Amiga. that race we were delivered in second position it gives us a total time and according to that we get some cash as well and so we can spend that cash on a number of items or we can save that cash which is what I'm going to do so it gives us some breakdown of what we've managed to do but this is the very first track it's the same track that we've already run all over the first time around so why why does it do that? Well, this game plays the same track three times in a row and the winner or the outcome of three times in a row is actually the outcome of the race. Now it doesn't tend to be done that much these days and definitely with Formula 1 you could argue the qualifying and the warm up and the race breaks down into three different segments and only the race counts for score. But in other formulas, they run three races and they might score points for all three races. One of those might even be a reverse race or a reverse grid. And it would be a good idea to buy myself some tires, but in this game, it either works or it doesn't work and it carries on working usually unless you have maybe 50% remaining and then it decides to get a bit less so at this particular point I don't really want to buy myself anything extra because that won't give me any more grip on the level so what I really want to do is to memorize this level and hopefully to get through it and this is the final race you'll be glad to know before we move on to a new one and now all we need to do is to speed up all the way through it and to make our way beyond those trees which are semi-pixelated and beyond the sky and beyond the clouds which don't exist and the 
track side and you can see there is some colour variation as well, patches of grass and desert and highland and all of these things going to make up this game. We have one more lap to go, and that means that we can floor it, cut out all of these corners, and hopefully get through to that line. And it's not obvious where that line is, look at that. Hopefully, you can even take a shortcut on some of these things. And the best lap time. Number one, Dan's doing number one. I've now got 12 points in that championship. We can now save the game at this point. And if we choose to do that onto the hard drive, that will save our progress and it will also save our cash. So, again, there isn't much point in buying any of these stock items, but we can upgrade and buy armor upgrades and things like that. They will cost a fortune and they are way, 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 way above what we've managed to cobble together already. So we can't buy any of them. All we can do is, well, we can upgrade the armor a little bit. That will save us taking damage. And if we don't take damage, hopefully that will save us expenditure on the other internal items. Fog course, it's foggy, and I can't remember whether I played this with the joystick or the mouse, but there is a quick way around these corners. There is a technique where there is something that you can employ, and it will get you around these corners a lot more smarter. And I only figured that out halfway through this playthrough. This is my one and only play of this game, and I haven't played this game since this was recorded in 2018. Luckily, the AI isn't intelligent enough to budge us off the track, but we are certainly intelligent enough to go the wrong way and know that we've gone the wrong way, so we'll have to turn around and go the right way, and sometimes that's possible on these tracks, and even though there is a map on the top left corner, most people will ignore the map completely and maybe not even notice that it's there. This level you might notice that we have some fog and that doesn't really help us turn these corners but what the fog will do will give us a fog of war and those enemies will appear and we'll have to overtake them without crashing into the back and as you can see on easy mode it is possible but look at that going the wrong way again means we crashed out that means well race result we won it all that sometimes it's a good idea to check out the parts shop and see what is available and consider what you're saving it for and consider really what needs it and mark one shock absorbers help us get over those bumps some of the tracks are really bumpy and again this is the first time i've seen this look at that defcon 4 armor and that's relatively cheap and again that will save us getting that damage so let's continue again we need to complete these tracks three times and then having done that three times then we get to move on to the next track and these tracks are very short you might notice and each circuit only takes a few moments so in theory given those few moments it shouldn't be too much of a hardship to get all the way around them and to win another Grand Prix. And so let's skip right through onto Death Valley for the final time, hopefully. And this is hopefully the final time after you've played it three times. You should be good enough to speed through it full speed, knowing this track inside out. 
So if you fail on the first one and do miserable on the second one, then surely on the third time around on the same event, then we should be able to get that first position. And you can see our total is 24 points. That means we have to track to are at the top of that leaderboard. Checking out the shop, once again, it would be an idea to buy studded tyres on the tracks which are requiring of those studs. I don't think there isn't too many slippy slidey tracks on this game. And the ones that we've got already seem to have studs on them. Street grinders. And they're pretty cheap at 3,000, since we have 17,000. Those aren't too bad. And the rest come in pretty cheap. But the ones we've got are turbo tyres for 2,000. And so, well, the slicks don't come in handy on the snow courses. And definitely don't buy the slicks if you're heading into a snow course. Not that we know what course we're heading into. Turns out it turns out to the desert. So slick tires in the desert perhaps isn't the necessarily best thing when you've got sand going around and junctions as well, which means we better keep an eye on that map. This is not super sprint. This is not the map that we normally face when we're using these kind of driving games. who remembers supercars and supercars too will remember the types of driving games that we used to get on the Amiga. can be surprisingly frustrating to be very slow when we go offline and that will slow the car down almost to a stop. So as long as we keep our wheels on fire on that track, that will mean that we can get through this and we can get through it all in one piece. That means we can hopefully get a good position and again on this easy mode it's not too bad as long as we know those tracks. And we've definitely memorised that track now, it's a figure of eight. So let's just skip on through to the next one and with the car in that current condition that's all I can really do unless I want to spend, spend, spend money on some new performance. Definitely shock absorbers with this track would be beneficial so let's grab some of those. It still leaves us 10 grand in the bank and just like supercars too it's great to juggle that money. Unfortunately this is not the stock market and we do not have interviews in this game and mental dexterity choices that we'll have to maneuver our way around press and animal rights activists and things like that. So in my mind this game has taken a step backwards of the Supercars 2 formula and now we get the actual track in the corner. So let's speed it on through hopefully to another defeat by me as I struggle my way around this ridiculous track in Wheels on Fire! It might surprise you to learn that I've actually narrated this particular play guide once already because I distinctly remember my catchphrase being wheels on fire all the way through it and having a right laugh and a right joke. But for some reason it didn't record and that's probably why this very play guide stuck on the shelf for many years because I couldn't be bothered to go back and re-narrate it, having narrated it already and come up with a load of rubbish trying to fill the gap between 45 minutes and the end of the review talking about this very bland and very mediocre game which happens to be a voxel racer. 
But I am having to narrate the whole thing all over again for this series. And why did I record this? Well, this was meant to be for the 3D series, which I recorded not last series, but the one before that, I think, which was meant to be 3D games. And I also recorded Alienator as well for that very series. And I didn't release those games. And unfortunately, I even recorded Alienator at least three or four times spending over an hour playing each one of them trying to get as best as footage as I could and I didn't bother to release the review. So these are reviews that have been held back for a long time and it's so long in fact that for some reason the original voiceover has been lost, my original notes I can't find them and the original microphone data I've gone back and looked through everything and I can't find it. So what we're going to have to do is to appreciate this multicolored desert. So what you can say is that the multicolors on offer is a step up from many driving games and they fade up and down hills. We take that for granted these days that hills consist of more than 16 colors but I'm not sure how many colors that we managed to get in this game. Looking at the other levels that do contain many colors it would seem that we do have at least 64 Whoa. maybe even 128 because this runs on an AGA, Amiga 1200 or Amiga 4000. And to run this thing you'll need 4 megabytes of fast RAM and a CD-ROM drive and a hard drive and you'll have to install this to the hard drive and run it and then hopefully you can get this game to run. And I can't remember where I got this game from, it could have been the old English Amiga board file server but wherever I got it from, wheels on fire! And this is number two, the second lap of this fancy course. Even though it seems to be in the desert, we don't have any more cacti. It seems that we have pine trees in the desert. Look at that, stuck in the scenery. So sometimes with these types of games, you have to have a map. And it's not the type of map that you used to have. That was a block map. Now this is a voxel map. And that means that, well, like the settlers, you have a texture all across the game world and that texture defines what can be built on it and what is on it and that texture in this case is texturing up to hills and the height of those hills are automatically shaded depending on their height so the computer isn't doing nothing except for automatically pre-rendering this landscape and shading things over the top of it and so whatever wizardry is involved I'm not quite sure what setup I used to play this. If in fact I played this on an 060, perhaps I chose the 040 to play this. So I can play this nice and quick, but according to my review on Lemon Amiga, that was basically playable on the Amiga 1200 with some fast RAM. So I'm presuming, given that I wrote that review on Lemon Amiga and left that comment, that that's what I used at the time, given that I haven't played this game since. So you can see that you can buy lots of groovy engines, and I'm buying the best engine, or at least one of the best, in the book. It's got a Japanese name to it, so it's got to be the best, and it's going to be hard wearing as well. And look at that suspension, what can we afford? Well, not much. Let's see what we can afford with six grand suspension, and look at that, just short of one of them and we can afford the other one. So we can't get the Japanese gas pressure dampers but we can get, well look at that, just about 400 left. Max speed is definitely what you want on a snow track so the biggest best engine is definitely what you need and so buying completely the wrong things here. Suspension is definitely not what you need either. You need soft suspension for snow and grippy tires. So what we have got instead is the best suspension and the best engine, which will mean we're revving all over the place and we don't have any grip on the surface. Game 
can be disorientating at first until you learn the track, but it doesn't take too many laps to do that. And that's only because the tracks look very samey, only the colours tend to change. And you can see this track is very similar to all the tracks we've seen already. And yes, it's white. And you can see no clouds in the sky again. Unlike other games. And there are definitely clouds in the sky for the old school type. And even Virtual Kart Simulator, even though it ran on maybe uh, hazard to guess, eight colours, whatever that thing ran on. It still had clouds in the sky. And so, this is race won by somebody else. Unfortunately, we didn't win that race. And that means that we didn't get that cash that became second. And we got the best lap time, which I'm not sure gives us anything in this particular game. If, in fact, the best lap time gives you anything in any game. You can see we've worn out our tyres, that's unsurprising, spinning our tyres out with the best engine, with the crappiest tyres on that kind of surface, so let's get some spikes on for the second lap, and let's see if that makes things any easier. Go. Speeding through the footage, you have to notice that sometimes the tracks really do destroy one thing or another. And if you destroy the opponents, they'll destroy your armor. And if you jump over too many hills, they'll destroy your suspension. And I'm not quite sure what destroys the engine. I think that just depletes at a regular rate, depending on basically the amount of speed that you're going at the time. And we can see a basic layout is present on the screen. The map, of course, in the top corner. Our current position. And lap one of four. Yes, four laps we have to get through. And the best lap time and the last lap time will appear after the first lap. Because it's a standing start. We'll not get a time in the first lap. So it's basically the one lap and then the time starts after that and then we we'll get whatever we got and then we we'll get some statistics and you can see those statistics at the bottom right corner and we can also see our current speed as well and we can get somewhere around the top speed on the straights but most of the time we don't get too many straights on these levels you might notice the track layout has done a slight turn from the previous one Instead of the bite of the apple being to the left hand side, it's now on the top. And so the track has moved, but the track layout really hasn't. So what I'm actually doing is driving as fast as I can, cutting out all these corners. Not necessarily to keep the lead, but to cut out as much as I can to maintain some kind of fun in the game. Track 3, race result, Division 2, and I think there are at least 5 divisions that you can get through as you move through this game, and these are predefined courses, and that's why it gives us the intro to every single course, and balancing our money is difficult because if we do that too early, we'll waste money. And look at that arm is on 41% and I'm already thinking about buying extra armor and spending every penny that I've got on it. That is precisely what we do. And that is not particularly great. If I'd have lost armor on that track, that means that everything else would disintegrate. But buying the cheapest, most ridiculous armor like this means that basically we'll have to stay out of trouble. So that's what I'm doing. Luckily it's a nice wide track, which is just as well because you have to, I think, let your finger release the fire button to stop and that will slow down and skid at the same time. And I think releasing fire button is the quick way around these corners. And I'm just beginning to realize that. You can go full speed, release, and then back on it again. That releases a skid. And so we can skid around all these corners, just like this. It means getting around these corners is pretty easy. And it means no more colliding with that scenery. Bad 
Skipping forward, you can see on the bottom corner of the readout, it gives us a logo of a car, various symbols and various colours around them. Well, if we look at the top left, that's talking about the air intake. Apparently the air intake on this car is fine. We're now skipping really quickly through them and we find another snow course. And if we check out the map of the snow course, yes, the map layout is exactly the same except the bias of the apple is now on the right. So it's a square with a bite out of it. And we'll have to go around that again. Facing these same opponents again for the same four laps again. Just joining us, you've joined Wheels on Fire, the greatest game that ever lived and during the first commentary of this game I really sent this up like crazy and I can't remember a thing about what I said during that so I'm taking this fairly easy, not really coming up with too much to say because there isn't too much to say about it. The creators didn't create much apart from one game on the Amiga and so the music isn't remarkable, the graphics are a demo which happens to be playable and yes this was possible on the Amiga but what they achieved is playable but not really I would say in a kind of fun way so skipping through this is Lil Lupin on Wheels on Fire and so Lil Lupin look at that we are now in a loop let's see if we can survive first corner yes and oh no, if only these things were mined and blew up, at least that would give us some action. And if only that water made us skid off, which I don't think it does. But look at that arrow, we can jump over and it says, well done, you've jumped over something. Woohoo, look at that, wheels on fire. And this game, look at it, this is the best game on the Amiga, if you ignore all the other games on the Amiga. And it's not as bad as Desert Racing of Bardos, but then again, no racing game on the Amiga quite is as bad as that, and it's as unplayable as that, and it's as unwelcome in the memories as that particular game. So if we can remember by some miracle following those arrows the right way to go, hopefully this becomes a lot more interesting that we can gain a bit of height on those guys, and those enemies, those competitors in this case, those other drivers, those players, not necessarily men or women, animal, mineral or vegetable, those guys could be anything, even remote control, and to my mind what we're actually playing is a remote control racer. Yes, this is not a full speed, full screen, full high octane racer. This is actually a remote control racer to my money, and this reminds me more of the games that we got on the PlayStation 2 where we got to drive a remote control race car around remote control racetrack and high speed jumping over all these things. Due to the physics involved we get to see some amazing action in some of these courses and seeing cars flying overhead never gets boring as long as we're on the lead because that means that we can afford something in the shop. The best things are usually the most expensive of course, sometimes it's best to play it safe and just buy the cheapest, that means we should have plenty of money later on and I'm taking a gamble at this point. We don't need no wall in this game. It's the wall everybody and that only means that we drive around at right angles. So it's Detroit all over again and Phoenix, Arizona, bang, let's smash into that side of that wall and look at that, it even tells us that we're supposed to loop the loop. So if you haven't realised that you can let go of that fire button and skid around all the corners by now, you're going to have to learn pretty quick. Because this is the divide between the good courses, the boring courses, I should say, and the ones that have a modicum of intelligence to them. See a maze going on, we are not Pac-Man, we cannot collect any power pills, 
We cannot collect any speed ups either, or anything which will improve our car. You can see in the bottom left corner, the first measure of interest is the airbox, which is on orange at the moment. And across from that, there are the spark plugs, I think, or the suspension, that's on light green. You can see the turbo is on deep red, so the turbo is in big trouble, and the tyres, ironically, are on green, because we can't get much speed up to use the tyres, and so the turbo is spent, and that will restart the damaged engine at this point, which, which isn't doing us any favours at all. Remember this type of 3D environment from the PlayStation 1, and if you keep your eyes closed very tightly indeed and imagine very blocky graphics the size of these blocks, then you might realise that this is the bridge between the, well, 2.5D Amiga variants and the 3D, the actual 3D, of the PlayStation, and that didn't use voxels or tessels, or whatever they're called, that use polygons, and that uses an extra row, I think that's a square instead of a triangle, but whatever it is, they managed to create something that was unequal on all sides, and that meant that you could draw anything that was unequal on all sides. Not necessarily a sphere, but everything else was fine. In this game, you can see ray traced artwork between all of the races, is the same artwork you see between all of the races, and so let's move on to our next track. This track layer is very familiar with this one. You can see I like the stones, I like the pits everywhere, and even the general dip and fall of the track reminds me of a great game, even though it's the same track layer that we're familiar with, it's got a bit bigger, and it's still easy to be convinced that we're going the right way, even though we are not. So this track is kind of fun and they do start to get more fun as it goes along, it's just that we have to wade through quite a few boring ones before we get there, and according to the magazine reviews, the average player will not reach level 5 on their very first play. Maybe they will, maybe they won't, I'm not quite sure, but this is high up in the levels already, and I think we progress a division every so often, and I haven't really been noticing that because I've been skipping past these things and with my eyes tightly closed I'm trying to imagine playing this on a PS1 and getting a lot more fun out of it. So Wheels on Fire was produced by Epic Marketing in 1997 and they produced some homebrew games which turned into commercial releases and this was a small production team involved with this one and so you can't say it was a bedroom coder by this stage but at the same time, because most things were emerging out of Eastern Europe at this particular point, there wasn't much in the way of the Amiga scene which was really pushing the boundaries except for the real-time strategy games, and Napalm and Earth 2140 and all the others that emerged at that time were amazing but it didn't really leave any room for these voxel races and we had our breath wetted at these voxel races that it was possible on your Amiga, yes, and without so much horsepower that you would need too much horsepower but we got Shadow of the Third Moon which you might remember from the top ten games that you've never even heard about Shadow of the Third Moon which was a flying simulator using the voxel environment we could fly around a huge landscape, so it was possible to create something the size of Outrun in voxels, 
Nobody did that because nobody cared. And this is surprisingly better than the outrun variant that we got on the Amiga. That goes without question because, again, every game in the book, apart from Desert Racing and Boyd Off, ironically, is more playable than the Amiga version of Outrun. So let's look at this. We're now on a night course, and you can see shading is perhaps the standout point of this game. They were very proud of the shading, they were very proud of the ray tracing effects and the automatic track creation and the procedural generation of some of these things, no doubt, to save them time. And they could have made a construction kit for these, of which they probably did, and there are many more tracks available for this particular game, and they probably proved this as it went on. You can see my tyres haven't improved much, so I'm going to get the most expensive ones. That's a ridiculous waste of time. I should have saved that money for the engine or something which would have been a bit more productive. But here we go on a dirt road, and wow, what a difference to the track. It has now turned again, and so we have more hills and more bumps, and we have more mud on the road which means all that money that we spent on slick tyres means we're skidding off all over the place again. joining us this is the top 10 most boring racing games on the Amiga this is in the top 10 this is wheels on fire and if your wheels on fire aren't on fire by now why aren't they because this thing is crazy it's insane roll up roll up this is hot if you have an Amiga AGA this really beats anything that is on the AJ chipset as far as racing games, apart from all the others, and even Bump and Burn was infuriating, but it wasn't as boring going around as this thing is on Amiga. So why am I reviewing it? Well, nobody else is going to review it, ever. And so this is a Lemon Amiga review, and every so often I like to try games because of the cover, because of the picture on the box, because of the image artwork on Lemon Amiga, because of the fan reviews, because of comments and things like that because I found it on haul and I was interested in voxel racers so that's why I've recorded it and that's why I'm reviewing it and that's why we'll also be reviewing other things that other players will not review in a million years such as ants and other games like that but what we are playing is the last few tracks of wheels on fire so we can attempt to sum things up by bringing out those scores and Amiga format gave this game 45% and that's very deserved, 45% and you won't find too many magazines around in that period so you won't find too many magazine scores for this game and Lemon Amiga gave this 54% so 45 and 54 brings us to an average of 5 out of 10 Look at that! And he's off the circuit again! He's through! He's in fourth position! Round and round and round they go! And it's go, 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 go! Crash! Bang! Smash! And Nigel Mansell, even Nigel Mansell cannot destroy his cars, man! Oh my, oh my god! Fortunately, too many crashes means our car suspension is destroyed! 
and that means that we'll have to get through to that line by hook or any other means, because we'll not be able to complete that race until we get ourselves over there, one way or another. And if your car is completely destroyed, it won't blow up, it'll just move very, very slowly and leave you with no money left to continue, because your car is moving very, very slowly. So let's investigate the very cheapest option that we can possibly buy and the hope that we can get through onto the next course. You'll be glad to know that Wheels on Fire is almost at an end and this is the first and the last time you'll ever see this game. So this is my play of it to save you that bother. This is my first impressions of the game and I'd say, wow, look at that. Wow, look at that. The fog effects are great, the night effects are great, the colours are great, the handling, the steering, the everything else about this game is great, apart from the easiness, which is on easy mode, unfortunately I should have put this on difficult to give us a small chance of it being difficult, and also the very fact that it's too long with too many races going on, and too many laps, and we could have had more, better, bigger, and more going on than what is actually going on, and it feels like a grown-up licenseware product, and it feels like a demo with front cover. But that will be too harsh, it's worth 5 out of 10, there's nothing wrong with it, it's playable, it's got good graphics, good colours, it's got sampled audio, and you can have loads of tracks and everything else on it. So, thank you for viewing one of these Lamanega play guides, and now that you understand this game, I hope we can avoid it sometime soon.